Well, hi everyone and greetings from Northern Michigan. This is Bob the Science Guy. You know, the other day I was on Jose J.G. Gonzalez's discussion forum and I had the opportunity to ask my seven Globe Earth Debate housekeeping questions to Sleeping Warrior and Arwen. I think that their answers are very interesting and I'd like to just go ahead and let them answer the questions with minimal comment from me. So, I hope you'll enjoy the show. Yeah, why don't we try the seven questions for Globe Earth housekeeping? Would you like to try yeah, we those, went Anthony? Them and written them all apart. Let's let's do it. Give me number one, Jose. I'll be happy to put these questions to both Anthony and Arwen. Okay, so we're cooking with gas. We have Sleeping Warrior. Uh, many of you may know him as Anthony Riley, regular on the Flat Earth Debate Show, and Arwen, also a regular on Nathan Oakley's Flat Earth Debate Show. So. Let's go ahead and start with the seven questions. Many times Flat Earth says things like the moon, etc., are what they call luminaries. I want to know specifically how a shadow can exist on a luminary. Or well, how can an apparent so what, shadow so what exist you're on a luminary, that, you mean? So what you're saying is that the shadow... It, right, so how do we know it's a shadow, first off? Exactly. Okay, well, well what, I'm, what I'm saying is, you know, for example, you can see shadows in moon craters. How does that occur on a luminary? What's oh, your answer? So you're assuming craters there, are you? You're already assuming a geometrical yeah. shape and then yeah. with presumed yeah. light fall on it. I filmed craters on the moon last night. Ooh. Are you filming? Um, do you guys have an answer to the question or are you just going to debate the yeah, question? Yeah, we do. Yeah, your assumption that they're craters and that they're shadows in the first place. Uh, yeah, I have no. Proof. We can see both Arwen. Okay, so that's Arwen's answer. Yes. Anthony, yours. The question is if the moon is a luminary, how can we see shadows in craters on the moon? How can you have a shadow on a luminary? It's a good question. Let me have a think. I'm happy to say that you can't have a shadow on a luminary. Okay, so Arwen started off the question and answer period, which he volunteered to be in, by the way, by saying he doesn't know what the moon is, he doesn't know that it's a crater, he doesn't know that it's a shadow. He basically dodged the whole thing. Anthony contemplated it for a moment and came up with a very appropriate answer. He doesn't know how a shadow could form on a luminary. How can you have a shadow on an object that lets off light? So I can respect Anthony's answer on that one. I think he was honest. All righty. Question number two. If water finds its level, how does the water change tides? <laughs> it's definitely not caused by the moon, is it? Because you know, gravity is not a force. I didn't ask well, what it, it wasn't caused by. Yeah, it has it been demonstrated. By. It has been demonstrated through electricity that salt water can actually be bended. Hang on. Hang on. We're why, do, why do we need to pose a, a, a solution for your inadequacy in your model? True, but that was not exactly the question. Yeah, but we don't need to answer okay, it. Okay, both of you both of you agreed well, to, answer to answer the answer seven them. globe housekeeping questions. Now, yeah, yeah. that's what we're here for. I'm not interrupting you. I'm not questioning your answers. I just want to get an answer from you. So if water always finds its level, how does the water level change with tides? It's still subjected to forces other than just the, the one that it has in its natural state. Do like you have a force, our way, forces? Or... Yeah, 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 we do. Okay, well, please go ahead and say what it is. Causes, there's something magnetic causing it at certain intervals in very specific patterns. There's there, We've seen maps that actually keep track of how the tides happen and when it's weird circly shapes it's it seems very much like it's magnetic in nature so it's likely directly caused by the ether in some fashion uh, most likely since the the highest tides seem to be near a magn yeah a very metallic rock magnetized rock that it is directly related to magnetism and yeah where magnetic rocks are higher will the tides be on these specific time intervals when it happens okay anthony do you have a different question or do you agree with that one or excuse me a different answer or do you agree with that one i have a different answer um we know that gravity is not a force therefore the moon cannot be causing tides it is not my place to provide a solution to the problem in your model. 
Okay, so you don't have an answer as to why it happens. Well, guys, I want to thank everybody for telling me that this is Brixton in Devon in England. Apparently, half of Team Bob the Science Guy lives in this little town. And uh, I appreciate you stopping by the comments and letting me know. Now, right now, both Arwen and Anthony Riley or Sleeping Warrior realize they're in a lot of trouble. This isn't turning out to be a hostile give and take by me. I'm just asking straightforward questions that they don't have answers to. And they're uncomfortable with that. They can't determine the flow of the conversation. Now, Arwen's response to this particular question is basically a word salad of magnetism. Uh, it's just pretty discombobulated and doesn't really have any rhyme or reason to it. Anthony is wisely refusing to go on record by saying what he thinks the tides are caused by and trying to shift the burden back on to me. Um, the bottom line is, these are the housekeeping questions for the Globe Earth Debate Show. You can answer them or not answer them. I don't care if you do one way or the other. But um, if you don't have an answer, just be honest like you were in the first one and say you don't know. Question number three, how do you falsify the flat Earth? You falsify the globe by showing there's no curvature. How do you falsify the flat Earth? By showing this curve. <laughs> right. Okay, good answers. Well, at least we're getting a straight answer out of them. You falsify the globe Earth by showing that there's no curve, and you falsify the flat Earth by showing there is a curve. My first video, November 28th last year. There's the curve, Chief. Flat Earth is falsified. Okay, number four. How many people know about the hidden truth of the flat Earth, and how did you find out? How many people know? Well, I think that a lot more people know than they would give hint at. And some people may know partially and just kind of buried it back down, like okay, as poop. part of a function or whatever. Or well, functionaries, maybe? People high up, uh, yeah, that have more direct control over how things are decided. Are you in that group? No. How did you find out? I guess by being very inquisitive and unrelenting, especially when I was young. Okay. Hey, Anthony, do you have an answer to that? I have no idea. And I found out because I realized that gravity wasn't a fort and I realized that you can't have gas pressure next to a vacuum without some kind of membrane. Okay, so Arwen's answer here is functionaries. These are the people that know the truth about the flat earth. And when pressed on that, he can't tell me who these functionaries are. But he did find out about it as a teenager in the Netherlands, apparently, because he's inquisitive. Well, Anthony Riley wins this round hands down for two reasons. One is he truthfully answered that he does not know who knows the truth about the flat earth. He doesn't know what the groups are or if there are groups. And he also wins because even though he has been repeatedly shown to be incorrect, he is sticking with his narrative that gravity is not a force and you cannot have gas pressure next to a vacuum without a membrane. Even though those have absolutely nothing to do with this question, he did manage to get them out, and he's sticking consistent with his narrative. Number five, what forces cause the sun and the moon to revolve above the flat Earth? And as a corollary to that, the sun revolves around the flat Earth between the Tropic of Capricorn and the Tropic of Cancer, and then back again. So you'll have to mention, too, what causes it to go north and south like that. Yeah, I'll go first with that. Easy. So we can demonstrate with quantum levitation that metal or steel or whatever, steel discs can be suspended above surface areas with um, high voltage and cold temperatures. That's what quantum levitation is. Um, that makes a small scale reasonable application of uh, an explanation for how and why a moon can orbit above a flat plane. Quantum levitation demonstrates it on a small scale. Um, and then with regards to the Tropic of Cancer and Tropic of Capricorn, the path of the orbit of both the objects. Um, you argue that they shouldn't, they should speed up and slow down. Well, they don't need to speed up and slow down. They maintain a circular path around the North Pole, and then that circular path itself moves up and down, but relative to the sun's position on that path, it's continuously at the same distance and the same speed away from all observers all the time. The ecliptic path of the sun 
on the flat earth model is the same as it is on the ball earth model the sun is doing perfect circles but the circle itself is moving up and down so the sun isn't changing its speed to the observer but it is changing its position along the, ep the uh, ecliptic path of the sun okay so just to make sure that i'm very clear on your answer anthony you say that the circular path of the sun is set and does not change but the entire circular path moves north and south yeah that's why we don't have a change okay. in speed north and south the ecliptic path of the sun moves but right. the sun on its path doesn't so let's take anthony's portion of this first the first part of the question was what forces keep the sun and the moon in circular motion above the flat earth and Anthony's answer was quantum levitation, which implies two things. One, there is some sort of an energy source, perhaps interacting between the Earth and the Sun. And he offers no measurable evidence of this energy source that, he, that would be required. The second is he implies that the Sun is metal, again, without offering any supporting evidence. Now, the second part of his answer has to do with the Tropic of Cancer and the Tropic of Capricorn. He maintains that the sun itself does not change the circular path that it follows around the sky over the flat earth. It doesn't increase in diameter around the North Pole. What it does do is that it shifts north and south, depending on the time of year. But we have a little bit of a problem with this, and that is when the sun is over the Tropic of Cancer in the Northern Hemisphere, where would it have to be in the Southern Hemisphere on the opposite side of the Earth? Yet on Earth, when the sun is over the Tropic of Cancer in June, it's over the Tropic of Cancer in both the Northern and the Southern Hemisphere at all points on the Earth. So. I think that he would probably be best to try and put a video out and model this theory of his because I'm having a little trouble picturing the geometry in my head. Well guys, this is a pretty extensive video and I'm going to go ahead and break it into two parts. The next part will be done tomorrow morning. Now, we'll finish up with Arwen's answer, but I want to give you a little hint as to something that's coming later in the week. I've ordered some equipment and it's arrived. Here it is. I think we may have to do a little science later on this week. So I hope you'll hit that like and subscribe button down in the lower right corner. This is Bob the Science Guy signing out from Northern Michigan. Thanks for stopping by. Mm -hmm.